Good uh, afternoon, and thank you very much for uh, the invitation. So perhaps uh, my, my talk uh, should be called uh, Acronym Attack. So if you don't like acronyms, uh, maybe uh, you won't appreciate it. Um, my idea is to, to give you uh, an overview of uh, all the different uh, transfers mechanism that you have uh, at the EU level and at the, uh, at the Eurozone level. So I hope uh, 20 minutes uh, will, be, will be enough uh, for that. Of course, I should um, qualify that you cannot just add these amounts uh, onto each other. These are a whole range of programs with all kinds of different uh, distortions. But I think it's, it's very important to, um, uh, to, to, to make an overview, to, to, uh, to, um, to make clear how, how far we have already gone down the rabbit hole of the, um, the Hamiltonian uh, Europe, uh, so to speak. And then, of course, I don't uh, uh, mean to, uh, mean to complement the, the EU uh, with um, comparing it to, to Hamilton. So first of all, the, the fiscal transfers mechanisms. The fiscal transfer mechanisms, I mean, the, the, the most um, well-known uh, fiscal transfer mechanism in the EU is the so-called MFF, uh, the multi-annual financial framework, the seven-year budget of the EU, which amounts to uh, uh, 1.1 trillion uh, euro over seven years. There are several, several calculations on who the net payers, the net uh, receivers are. You can look at, uh, of course, the absolute contributions, the, um, uh, the contributions per capita, the contributions per capita, uh, in terms of, uh, of GNI, but typically we see that countries like Germany, Sweden, uh, the Netherlands are the big, um, the big contributors of the whole um, EU budget, and, and um, the likes of Bulgaria uh, tend to be the big uh, uh, recipient. Second um, mechanism is the uh, EU Recovery Fund. I'm sure you've been following that. This was um, unfortunately agreed last year. Um, it's called uh, NGEU, uh, Next Generation EU. Some call it Debt Generation EU because it has been dubbed uh, by the FT, which was wildly enthusiastic about it. Uh, Europe's Hamiltonian moment. Uh, what is so special about it? Uh, not so much the amount. The amount is gigantic. It's uh, 800 billion euro. That's one thing. Um, the, uh, the special thing about it is that uh, it is the sort of the largest uh, joint issuance of debt so far uh, at, the, at, the, at the EU level. And um, this makes me rather pessimistic uh, because I don't think this will be a one-off uh, thing. Uh, you may have remembered that last year when we had the negotiations, you had the frugal four, four countries that were opposing this. Uh, decision, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Denmark, Sweden, and uh, um, I think it was Austria, and at some point they were frugal five. Anyway, they, they lost, uh, they lost, um, but the Dutch Prime Minister said, yeah, we lost, but at least it's a one-off operation. Why is it not going to be a one-off operation? Because it's 800 billion that the EU is borrowing. Um, will of course one, one, at one point need to be paid back and then um, there are several options if the EU wants to create EU taxes it may get its way to a certain degree but I suspect that's going to be resisted um, it may just ask member states to uh, to pay up and to 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 pay the bill um, not very realistic I think the most realistic thing is of course that the that they will agree to just take out the new loan to pay back the old loan, because that's sort of the standard procedure, I think, apart from Luxembourg, correct me if I'm wrong, for European, uh, European governments. So uh, unfortunately, this thing is here to stay. And, um, and you may have followed the shenanigans with Poland and uh, Hungary being denied their fair share. Uh, but I think at some point the EU Commission will just uh, give them the money and, and they'll, uh, they'll continue with business as, uh, as usual. Um, 
I only have 20 minutes, so I, I should, uh, I've only come to the third <laughs> scheme, which is uh, the European Investment Bank, technically not part of the EU, but established under the EU treaty, 400 and 29 billion has already been disbursed by this, uh, you could say, European Sovereign Wealth Fund. Um, and they can disburse another uh, 101 billion to all kinds of uh, projects. Then there has been a temporary scheme, the Juncker Plan, called EFSI, European Fund for Strategic Investment, um, amounted to 401 billion of spending, mostly through guarantees. Then uh, more uh, well known is the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, uh, you could say an embryonic European finance ministry, was set up in the wake of the, of the Euro crisis or, or basically to try to deal with the Euro crisis. Um, uh, has 700 billion at its disposal, 80 billion of capital paid up by um, Eurozone countries and 620 billion borrowed. It has a maximum lending capacity of 500 billion, but this can be easily uh, increased if they, if they want to, but they don't really like that because then they have to ask the members of the Bundestag to, uh, to agree with it. Then we have a relatively small thing, a, five, a 25 billion pan-European guarantee fund managed by the European Investment Bank, uh, also to cope with the pandemic uh, decided last year. Then we have more well-known uh, SURE, SURE, uh, which is also a uh, European uh, or an EU joint borrowing um, undertaking. Uh, so the EU basically, uh, with the backing of the member states, uh, goes on the markets to borrow 100 billion euro. That money is then used to pay for uh, temporary unemployment schemes. It was also decided in the COVID crisis. So the COVID crisis really, I think, did a lot of bad. Um, then we have a small thing that exists for a long time, the EU balance of payment support, uh, which basically allows the EU, through also uh, jointly issuing bonds, to uh, provide support up to 50 billion euro to non-euro area uh, member states. So you have to be a member of the EU to get the money, but uh, you can't be a, um, um, a Eurozone member. Uh, then, of course, not to forget, perhaps not entirely right to include in this list, are the Eurozone and EU bailout transfers organized through the IMF. Eh? When Greece got into trouble, I think Ireland at some point as well, they, they got some of their bailouts through the IMF, so European countries were paying through the Eurozone mechanisms and through uh, the IMF. A similar arrangements exist uh, through the World Bank, much, much smaller uh, amount. I haven't looked at the details of that. Then we had the predecessors of the ESM, sort of the temporary uh, Eurozone lending schemes, the EFSF and the EFSM. The EFSF is um, only uh, paid by Eurozone countries to undertake uh, Eurozone bailouts, uh, amounted to 440 billion euro, but some bonds are still outstanding, of course. And then you have the EFSM. This is an interesting one because it was a Eurozone bailout scheme, but non-Euro countries like uh, the United Kingdom uh, also uh, took part uh, in, in this. And this uh, decision in the UK to take part in this uh, EFSM, um, which uh, only amounts to 60 billion, uh, but also is, is financed through uh, joint uh, EU uh, borrowing. This was in the UK decided on the weekend. You may remember when Labour uh, had been voted out of office and it took five days, imagine, to form a UK government. Everybody was getting really, really nervous in the UK. I'm from Belgium. We have the world record, I think two years or something almost. <laughs> uh, well, during that period, um, uh, George Osborne gave uh, tacit consent uh, to uh, the Labour government, I think, I forgot his name, uh, um, the finance minister or the, the, the chancellor to, to agree that the UK would effectively help bail out uh, Eurozone countries. La petite histoire, as we say. Um, then maybe a small thing to mention is that outside of the MFF ceilings, and of budget, we have a number of smaller uh, EU spending schemes that exist, a few hundred million, um, emergency aid reserve, European Union solidarity fund, the flexibility instrument, kept at 600 million a year, uh, and the European globalization adjustment fund, and then the European 
peace uh, facility. Then on top of that, we also have uh, joint EU lending, uh, joint EU borrowing, sorry, uh, uh, of which the proceeds are used to pay for non-EU countries. It exists. It's called macrofinancial assistance, but it, at the moment uh, there's no limit, but it, uh, only 4.6 billion, so some pocket changes outstanding at the moment. Uh, then also quite important, legally the European Union is not allowed to go into debt, uh, <laughs> um, so, so they sort of uh, do it anyway and call it differently. And apart from this sort of joint borrowing undertakings, undertakings they have something called in French reste à liquider, which are uh, unpaid uh, bills. So if you have uh, 300 billion of unpaid bills as the EU, uh, half the EU says, yeah, this is our unpaid bills, it's not debt, uh, I would call it uh, debt. Uh, so that's, uh, you could say, a future transfer, uh, given that these bills still need to be uh, paid. So I already made it uh, to uh, part two. Uh, this was uh, the fiscal, an overview of fiscal um, transfer mechanisms. Now, now we will go to uh, the second part, uh, which are uh, the monetary transfer uh, mechanisms. Uh, of course, uh, I limit it to the, the European Central Bank because I'm talking about transfer mechanisms between uh, European countries. I mean, the first way in which the, um, and now it gets really opaque, um, the, the first way in which the ECB undertakes transfers is, of course, its interest rate policies, its NI. RP, NIRP, uh, negative interest rates since 2014 um, in, the, in, the, in the Eurozone. Um, the second uh, big, uh, let's say, manner in which uh, they, uh, they organize these transfers is through asset purchasing. On the one hand, we have quantitative easing, eh, 2,600 billion euro in uh, PSPP, so that's public, I don't even know, but that's the regular uh, QE. Uh, the second QE program has been decided during the pandemic is uh, PEPP, Pandemic Emergency Purchasing uh, Program. Um, that's uh, the, the first part of ECB asset purchasing, whereby they basically print money and then, uh, and then buy, uh, buy these, um, these assets. Um, the second uh, part is um, through credit easing, as it's called, and there we have acronyms with the name SMP, OMT, um, ABSPP, CBPP3, and CSPP. Uh, SMP was the, the first. Um, I mean, you can imagine how attractive this is for politicians. Uh, I mean, like these are massive amounts of money. No, like, I mean, if you don't fall asleep. Uh, well, well uh, <laughs> trying to figure out what's going on, then, then there's something wrong. So, so this is incredibly interesting to, to organize all kinds of transfers that are uh, you know, hard, to, uh, hard to track uh, for uh, civil society, uh, opposition politicians. Uh, so the, this SMP is the Stab Stabilities and Market Program. It's sort of the, the first of, of its kind uh, undertaken by the, by the ECB. Um, the second one, OMT, is the is a outright monetary transactions. is is more like a promise. It has never been activated. It was challenged in court, though. I think ultimately the German constitutional court signed it off, but but with some grumbling. Um, and, uh, and and the idea is a program whereby the bank ECB would make purchases in secondary sovereign bond markets under certain conditions, of course, of bonds issued by eurozone uh, member states. Um, then you have um, uh, sort of a, how do you say that a twin, but with three, like a three three uh, uh, tripling. Um, the Asset-Backed Securities Purchase Program, ABSPP, Covered Bond Purchase Program, CBPP3, initiated in 2009, the first one in 2014. And then the third one is Corporate Sector Purchase Program, CSP, 2016. And, and to be fair, on the website of the ECB, you can sort of see like how they're uh, monthly, uh, how they have these monthly uh, purchases of that. It fluctuates a bit, but, but basically hundreds of billions of euros, and, or in that sense, sense being uh, 
printed to buy assets and then the ECB has all kinds of arguments that yeah but we are sterilizing this and 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 uh, um, in, in I would say relatively uh, shady way so it's, it's incredibly hard to uh, to try to calculate the actual distortions of all that but I'll, I'll come to that a third big part very important is uh, of, of uh, ECB or, or monetary transfer mechanisms is um, ECB subsidized lending programs to uh, to to banks the LTRO so as you know a central bank uh, lends uh, money at certain uh, relatively low interest rates to banks these are programs whereby the ECB gives uh, grants especially low interest rates to banks you have uh, the LTRO the long term refinancing operations and a few years later uh, the ECB has started with T LTRO the targeted uh, low, uh, I forgot, um, LTRO. Anyway, um, in 2020, um, the estimate was that this had all amounted to 1 trillion uh, euro. Uh, so, um, a, a lot of money. French President Sarkozy was very unhelpful for Germans when, uh, when he was uh, basically openly saying, well, the idea is that the banks then shift all that money to sovereigns. Uh, whereas, of course, the ECB was, was pretending it was not engaging in uh, monetary uh, financing, as banana republics do. Um, but Sarkozy was basically uh, saying that was not the case, that the whole point of these things was to engage in monetary financing. Um, a fourth... Um, mechanism, I would argue, in which you have monetary transfers is the promises that the ECB is making. In 2012, Mario Draghi said he would do, quote-unquote, whatever it takes. The fact that he says that is already, you know, having some, um, let's say, influence on the, on the value of the, of the euro. So I would say you could also consider that a, a route through which the ECB is conducting transfers. Last but not least, we have a thing called a Target 2. Target 2 is a, um, how to explain, a calculation system. Um, if you go on, hol on holiday with, a, uh, with, with friends and, and some friends buy the beer and other friends go to, uh, to the butcher to buy some meat and then in the end you compare uh, you know, how much money has been spent. Well, a similar thing exists at the, at the Eurozone level and actually uh, in, the, in the United States as well with, with the Fed. Um, now, um, what has happened in the Eurozone is, is Germany. Only Germany has gone through the, to the supermarket, has bought a lot of beer and, uh, and, and other uh, and foods. Um, and at the moment, in October, it had 1.12 trillion in claims uh, on this uh, joint uh, settlement system. Uh, the um, uh, it Italy and, and Spain uh, have uh, 1 trillion in debt uh, to that uh, system. Now, First of all, this target two is not something that, on, that comes necessarily on top of what I've mentioned. It is sort of like reflecting some of the things. Um, people say, well, this is actually not uh, a transfer yet, and that's true. It will only become a transfer when the Eurozone, break, uh, when the Eurozone breaks up. When the group of friends says, oh, we're no longer friends, and then, of course, the friend that has been advancing everything in the supermarket is stuck with the bill, and that friend is uh, Germany. Um, <laughs> then we have, last but not least, a small thing. It's called ELA, Emergency Liquidity Assistance. What is this? This is um, an exceptional uh, arrangement whereby national central banks can print money if their banks need money when the ECB is not willing to sufficiently print. And this has been used by a number of Eurozone countries, Belgium, Ireland, France, to a very modest degree, but mostly and most notably by Greece, when in 2015 it was partly shut off uh, by the ECB, but while the ECB still allowed it at some point to print uh, up to 90 billion euro a month to keep its uh, banking system alive. That was before that banking system was bailed out with the third Eurozone bailouts through the, the fiscal um, mechanisms. Um, 
Last but not least, um, okay, how do these monetary uh, transfer schemes um, actually cause transfers and cost? I would say in three ways. Uh, you have market distortions and, and distortions of market si signaling first. Then secondly, of course, when you have new euros being created that are not properly sterilized, you have a depreciation of existing stock of euros, not so much because of the fact that the new euros go to hard assets or that they remain in, in the banking system, but uh, because the fact that the, um, the old euros are, are, I mean, they are s simply depreciated even if uh, the new euros are not necessarily immediately visible in, uh, in CPI uh, statistics. Um, and uh, thirdly, a, a very important distortion is, of course, that this facilitates um, governments not to engage in reform. Um, Italy has been funded, Belgium has been funded, has not undertaken any proper reform since they have been entering the Eurozone, and this has led to the zombification of the um, of the economy, so very hard to quantify the exact damage to taxpayers and savers. That's why politicians love this monetary route uh, so much. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. I think we have no time. I have one short question. To have you summed up all those programs? In can you give us a figure? Yes. Oh, no, no. I, well, it would not be, um, it, it would rightly be criticized if I would do that. Uh, so, but next week on Brussels Report, I plan to publish it, and then every six months or so, I'll, uh, I'll provide an update so people can can try to see what, what's, what's going on. Uh, yeah, it's like a horror movie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you much, very much, Peter. Thank you.